Welcome to RPG Researches Weekly Training. My name is John Wilker, Vice President of RPG Research. Uh, broadcasting live from their locations is, starting with JD. Uh, hi, I'm JD. I'm from Crescent City, down south. Right on the really cold. Not excellently warm here. And Max? Max Lena from GM of One. Diving into the training, but I'm also quite pretty. Happily indoors and excited. Yeah. Excellent. Now, today's class will be covering uh, Introduction to Bleed Theory and with tips on bleed control basics, introduction to basic voice workshop, and applied gaming introduction, basic fantasy role playing game. For some reason. Okay, un momento, por favor. So reintroduce them. All right, I do apologize for that um, inconvenience. Technical difficulties created by user error, me. Um, let's start our introductions again. Go ahead, JD. Hi, I'm JD. I'm from Northern California in Crescent City, about 15 miles or so south of the Oregon California border, right on the coast. And it's quite cold here today. Welcome to the rest of the world. <laughs> and um max max uh gm level one uh uh just starting the class a few sessions ago uh it's unfortunately still as cold here as it was a few minutes ago all right and where are you again max uh in new york city uh thrilled to be here very excited for another game uh, uh game with the group uh, especially indoors where it's not so chilly been a while since I've been in New York. Uh, unfortunately, there's two places in New York that I never got to, even though I visited multiple times, and that Where? is Central Park. Uh, I have seen the Statue of Liberty, uh, and I haven't. I've been to Chinatown and Central, not Central. That one corner where the iron is, the iron. The flat iron. Flat iron, yeah. Herald Square. Hmm? Herald Square. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a good tourist. I, I go for, I have something to do. Let's go do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll gladly show you around when times are more peaceful. Yes, that sounds like fun. I've always, uh, the museum and the uh, park is my priorities. Mm -hmm. Likewise. So, um, go ahead. I was just going to say, I actually lived in upstate for about a year um, in Elmira, and I never actually made it to the city at all. There was um, an interesting town in New York. I believe it's called Good. It was, it was basically a pagan town in uh, okay. New York. The whole town was pagan, as opposed to. That's cool. So. A wizard shoots a lightning bolt from his magical staff at an enemy. The cleric wanting to know if he might also use it asks, That arcane? No, says the wizard. They are staff. That are staff. Yes. That arcane wow. versus that are staff. Good. That's pretty good, actually. Got it. Got it. I can take that. Yes, <laughs> the punitive punishment will proceed. Wars. <laughs> yeah. I sentenced you to three years in the penitentiary. Why did the adventurer want 
a Vorpal sword so badly? I don't know. He wanted to get ahead in the world. But a bump. Concerning the famous mutilating swords of old, he'll need the significantly less famous sword of slicing should he wish to instead to get a leg up on life. Oi. The party wizard keeps claiming he's ethereal and can walk through walls, but I think he's just going through a phase. Ugh. That was good. <laughs> that, was a good that, that was good, but it was bad. <laughs> hey, you should hear some of my science jokes. I love and, science jokes. All right. So we will now get into our most popular and favorite part of our lecture series, the quiz. Yes, we do the quiz first. You are not expected to know the answers at the first time we take the quiz because it is an introductory one to see where we sit. Baseline, as opposed to acid line. <laughs> so, um, everybody show up 15 minutes before the session. Everybody that did show up did. Did you guys complete? Did you complete your assigned task from the previous session? Yes. Do you remember what your assigned tasks were? That's always the way to tell if they actually did them. <laughs> uh, post in Discord or one of the other chats, do up a um, short essay, and um, what was the other one? Uh, and also to download the BFRPG core rulebook and character sheet. Oh, that's right. That's right. Did you and write a 250 to 500 word essay about your thoughts and experience on the previous session? I have. Okay. Can you summarize it? It was fun. It was fun. Did, did you... I really enjoyed um, No Thank You Evil. I liked its mechanic and how it um, handled getting the kids out of their seats. Right. Uh, the uh, LRPG elements that are in No Thank You Evil are added by RPG Research. The um, It does not mention in there getting people up out of their seats and doing things during the game. Really? Uh, I like that. We addition. find uh, it's an opportunity to good, too good to pass. Good tweaks. All right. Did you guys watch the... Um, the movie. Yep. Oh. Yeah, what did you think? They were cool. They were surprisingly enjoyable, even for uh, the sometimes challenged budgets. Uh, that's what I did my writing on. Uh, some, some, you, you got to do some hand waving between the low budget and it being somewhat of a product of its time. Uh, but there was some cool stuff that was brought up from time to time in the movie. I, I did a little write up on that. Um, I like the idea. They talked very early about Story Trump's rules and if that's true or not. They talked a lot about what rules are at arm's reach for the players versus what rules are at arm's reach for the DM. There was a lot of like, what happens when the party's just a bunch of murder hobos? And is that okay? Is that within within something that they're allowed to do? And should the GM be like, no, you can't play the game because you're not playing it like right. I, I thought there was a lot of cool, uh, interesting things brought up, and I thought it was fun. Like maybe you could glean that from watching someone else's game, but like it's really hard to watch someone else's game from a third party role where you're not playing it or running it and like retain focus. But because it was a movie, it was engaging yep. and funny. I was like, no, actually, I'm getting a lot of lessons here. Yep, we will go into that in great depth in a future class where we will sit near the end of the thing where we will go through and scene by scene and lots of stopping saying we'll, we'll talk a lot more about that. Any thoughts from JD? Um, in the gamers, my favorite scene is when they're standing at the side of the river and they just stand there. It goes back and forth between the players and the characters. And then the DM reminds the wizard, don't you remember about your crippling fear of water? And then the player goes, oh, yeah. And the character starts screaming. The barbarian hits him up into the air. And then you see them drop the dummy from the bridge. And you can see the shadow of the bridge on the beach. And it's just 
that's my favorite scene. It kind of combines that their their personas out of game and in game together. Really, really fun. All right. So you guys have a static and dynamic data uh, recording and retrieval device, correct? Excellent. We will now begin the quiz. Question one. In role-playing games, the one-word term used to describe the emotional, psychological, and physical states that can transfer between real life and fantasy role-playing playing gaming is... Thumbs when you got it. Okay, one. I got to look at the opposite screen now. All right, question two. According to the bleed theory, the imaginary boundary between the player's self-identity and the player character that is created by the rules, identities, and occurrences within the role-playing game session is known as the... One thumb, two thumbs, okay. But that doesn't impact. All right, question number three. Oh, yeah, that's right. Don't make it easy on yourself. Fish. Hey. All right. Uh, question number three. Did I? We already asked that one? Nope. Uh, the set of rules that are agreed upon by all participants on how to interact with each other in and out of characters such as no real life touching, stay in character for the duration of the session, and when a player throws a red foam packet, it symbolizes a fireball, etc. This is called the blank blank. One. Question four, perhaps the most important aspect of a social contract is the blank, in which players accept the premise that any action in the game are taken by the player character and not the player. Okay, good, good. Five, according to the bleed theory, the blank is also known as the blank blank, which is the real world person or persona rather than the imaginary character. Hey, okay, good. Question six. The imaginary person that is used within the game itself is known as the blank blank in most RPGs. The bleed theory, in bleed theory, this is also referred to as the blank blank of the participant. Is everybody still working on six? One thumb. Okay. Question number seven. 
BFRPG is an initialism for what? Where can you download it? I expect 100% on this question. One thumb. No, I gave you a thumb, I thought. Okay. Question number eight. For training, community programs, and high-risk populations, we recommend BFRPD instead of D&D &D and similar clones. According to the lecture, what are five of the reasons? Since you haven't heard the lecture yet, I, if you get all five right, I'm going to be really surprised. <laughs> Are you guys both using your workbooks? Yes, I am. Awesome. Ah, yeah. Remember, there are five instead of three items, like in the workbook. Yeah, I've added four and five to mine. I just haven't added answers. Max, how are you doing? Okay, you ready to move on? Okay. Question nine, according to bleed theory, when the real world emotions, thoughts, relationship dynamics, and physical states of the player have an effect on the player character, you see this is known as blank blank, whereas when events within the game have an effect on the real world player during or after the game, this is known as blank blank. Like we're good to move on to the next question? Yep. Final Jeopardy. Except you don't have to answer in the form of a question. What is one of the most important tools to help manage voicing between your own PCs or NPCs over the years and between many different groups? How does everybody think they did? Um, I probably pulled a 50 to 60%. Some of them, I wasn't, I had an idea of what the answer was, but it was way too similar to the earlier question, so I don't think it was right. Understood. A lot, a lot of the double blanks. I was like, whoa. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and discuss the answers then. Uh, JD, in role-playing games, the one-word term used to describe the emotional, psychological, and physical states that can transfer between real-life and fantasy role-playing gaming is... Bleed. 
Bleed is the correct answer. We will discuss this more um, during the lecture. So, Question two. Max, according to Bleed's theory, the imaginary boundary between the player's self-identity and the player character that is created by the rules, identities, and occurrences within the role-playing game session is known as the... Is that the player and the character? Uh, JD, do you have an idea? I do not know. It is Magic Circle. We'll explain that during the okay. lecture. Question three, Max. Set of rules that are agreed upon by all participants on how to interact with each other in and out of characters, such as no real life touching. Stay in character for the duration of the session. When a player throws a red foam packet, it symbolizes a fireball, etc. This is called the player etiquette or player etiquette code okay good guess max i mean jd i keep doing that today too <laughs> i initially put down house rules then i realized it should be social constructs shouldn't it or it's social contract. Co contract social, social contract, contract yeah. very close okay oops oops far Perhaps the most important aspect of the social contract is the blank, in which the players accept the premise that any actions in the game are taken by the player character and not by the player. I do believe this one is for JD. JD doesn't have an answer, nope. Max? Uh, would that be fear of the mind? No. Theater of the mind would have been many more blanks. It's alibi. That's the alibi, okay. Perhaps the most important aspect of the social contract is the alibi, in which players accept the premise that any action in the game are taken by the player character, not the player. Hmm. Question number five. JD, according to Bleed Theory, the blank is also known as the blank blank in which the real world person or persona rather than the imaginary character. Um, I got the first, I think, as player, but I don't know what the other two are. Okay. Um, Max, you have any thoughts? Yeah, I thought it was a player and player character. Okay. According to Bleed Theory, the self is also known as the primary identity, which is the real-world person or persona rather than the imaginary character. Got it. So it's self and primary identity? Correct. Six. Imaginary persona that is used within the game itself is known as the blank blank in most RPGs. In Bleed Theory, this is also referred to as the blank blank of the participant. Max? This was one of the ones where I had used like player character so many times, I'm like, I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> okay. And um, um, JD? I didn't get the first two, but I believe the second two are alter ego. Correct. Oh. So the first one is player character or PC. Okay. <laughs> And the other one's alter ego. The imaginary persona that is used within the game itself is known as the player character in most RPGs. Lead theory, this is also referenced to as the alter ego of the participant. Oh. JD. BFRPG is an initialism for what? Where can you download it? Uh, basic Fantasy Role-Playing Game and BasicFantasy.org. Correct. And just for people who can't see this, it's www.basic-fantasy.org. I missed the dash. I'm sorry. All right. You'll learn it. <laughs> and lump it. <laughs> yeah, you not lump, love it or lump it. It's lump it and love it. Okay. All right. For training, community programs, and high-risk populations, we make, recommend... Our, BFRPG instead of D&D and, &D and similar clones. According to the lecture, what are five of <coughs> reasons, Max? Can you give me any? Uh, it's free. 
free. Uh, 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 very affordable, yes. Okay. Uh, it's more accessible in that it's online. You don't have to go to a store to buy it. Everyone could find it online. Okay, accessibility. Okay. Uh, easy to get, okay. Easy to get. All right. Um, I think it's easier to learn than uh, traditional core D&D. &D. It seems like the rules are simplified. It's quicker to pick up, maybe. Yeah, that can kind of be clear causality covered in later sessions about old school versus new school and casual learning. We'll talk causality, then what I say. I don't think I said casualty. Anyways, moving on. Mm. Uh, and casualty of learning. We uh, you died because you learned something. Anyways, <laughs> so the answer is accessibility, clear causality, C A U S A L I T Y, affordable print version, in addition to being free as PDFs, uh, easily customized, and easy to get. There are bonus point ones that we'll talk about during the lecture. Question number nine. The idea, according to belief theory, what is the real world emotions, thoughts, relationship dynamics, and physical states of the player have an effect on the player character, PC? This is known as blank. Whereas when events within the game have an effect on the real world player during or after the game, this is known as blank blank. Did I ask a question during the I had to have. Um, I don't know the actual terms that you're looking for for this, but I think I get the gist of what it's saying. Okay, what do you think? Um I I like I said, I don't know the terms. Okay. How about Max? Uh, I was not familiar. I actually have not uh, learned very much about bleed theory. Okay. And you're not supposed to have. Is this supposed to be the introduction to bleed theory? According to bleed mm. theory, when the real world emotion, thoughts, relationship dynamics, and physical states of the player have an effect on the player character, this is known as bleed in. Whereas when the game has an effect on the real world player during or after uh, the game, this is known as bleed out. Out. Uh, good word play. Yeah. Question 10. What is one of the most important tools to help manage voicing between your own player characters or NPCs over the years between many different groups? Nope. Nope. Um, I don't know if this is exactly the wording, but it's always like being vocal about problems and working towards uh, for hit die for a dwarf um, or for a cleric. No, in this hit die for your cleric. Uh, well, yeah, hit die for your cleric is die six. So roll a die six, add your con bonus or penalty, whichever you have. That would be a two. A two. Okay, two hit HP. All right, we'll get through the rest of those stuff in a moment. Let's talk to JD. What race are you, JD? All right, I am a human fighter. Um, I'm still digging through to get fighter stats and all that. Um, male or female? Male. Uh, hit points? I haven't rolled that up yet. What do fighters roll? I, like I said, I'm still trying to dig I through ate. to get that. Die eight. Copy that. Oh, uh, I have zero hit points. Yeah, you guys. What? I rolled a one, and I have a minus one for con, so I have zero hit points. The minimum you, die hit you can have is one. So I'm a fighter with one hit point. Correct. Lovely. And you need two thousand experience points to get to second level for the fighter, and the cleric needs to have um, one thousand five hundred experience points. Human, you get no bonuses for your racial. Uh, 
and your fighter saving throws okay are going to be death ray or poison 12 magic wands 13 paralysis or petrify 14 dragon breath 15 and spells 17 all right All right. Um, languages. The dwarf speaks common and dwarfish. And do you have an intelligence bonus? No. Okay. The fighter speaks common. Do you have a bonus to your intelligence modifier? I do. I have a plus one to that. Okay, so you can choose one additional language. Okay. When you think of it, let me know. Uh, he likes to swear in Dwarven. Okay. So you guys can talk to each other in two different languages. Good. All right, uh, cleric can use blunt weapons only, club, mace, maul, quarterstaff, sling, warhammer, any shield is allowed. You get no spells, but you can turn undead. Um, fighter, any weapons, any shields, um, any armor. No spells, no special stuff. Your job is to hit things until they until they stop wiggling. Yep. All right. So I do believe that we have in this pile here. Character, quick character All right. generation. Here we basic equipment packs. We're going to do basic equipment packs so we can get spend more time playing. Got it. All right, so standard equipment packs. This is for both of you. You get a backpack, six torches, tinderbox, flint and steel, a wine skin or water skin, depending on what you fill it with. A winter blanket, dry rations for one week, a large sack, a small sack, two of them, and roll um, a die six and multiply it by ten. Hey, twenty. Now let's let's talk about your um, additional packs. You got you're going to get given a choice of different packs. So fighter, you may have chainmail, shield, and longsword, which will weigh forty nine. But by the way, the weight of the basic pack is twenty one pounds. Okay. Chainmail, shield, longsword, uh, weight forty nine pale pounds. Or a chain mail and a pole arm, weight 55 pounds. Or leather armor, long sword. Yeah, I'll buy both for us. Okay. So that's an additional uh, 41 pounds of weight. I'm going to stick with what I have for the moment. Okay. Yeah. What page uh, is the standard equipment on? In the BFRPG? Okay. Yeah. Um, starting on page 10. Frank. Um, and Blaine. 
All right. Yeah. <laughs> That's only a minus three to damage, to hit and damage. What, what? It's a dwarven cleric. <laughs> oh. Oh. So minus It'll three be fun. hit. And your damage is what is the mall? Uh, the mall is one d ten. One die ten minus three. Ouch! Oh yeah, I forget. Um. So the long sword you have plus what to hit? Oh wait a minute! You got um, a minus plus three. One. But you get a plus one for your thing, so you're actually at minus two to hit. So what's your for your longsword? Um, plus one to hit. No strength bonus? So I have a 15 strength. Yeah, I have a 15 strength, so I get a plus one bonus. But you also get a, pl a plus one for your uh, attack bonus, so that's plus oh, two. Oh, so yeah, plus two now, yeah. Uh, damage? Uh, 1d8 plus one. And uh, the cleric, what's your dexterity? My dexterity is nine. Okay, so no penalty there. No penalty. So plus one to hit with the sling, and the damage is one die four plus. Uh, sling doesn't do strength damage, does it? So it's. So many different systems. <laughs> Ling bullet does one die four. Stone does one die three. And um, it's one d four plus one then. No, you you. It's one die four plus nothing. Uh, ah, sorry. You don't it's have plus a dex bonus. Got it. Oh, we're streaming? I'm okay. So, uh, you guys have accepted this perilous quest mm. to explore the cellar found in the woods. Now, Thanks. was there any prep that you wanted to do before you left? Um, I think head character right out description there? here in order. Our character description is in order? Yep. Okay. Sure. Uh, Max, do you want to go first? I, I do. Before uh, you, you guys first. do any prep, I do want to ask you two very important questions, or one important question for two yeah. of you. But we will we'll start with JD. What's your character's name? Andy. And Max? Omelet. Omelet. <laughs> Are you sure you're not a halfling? All right. Uh. <laughs> Excellent. So, awesome. what do you want to, um, what prep do you want to do, Max? Any prep before you go? Um, as a cleric, would, would I have any inkling into, it doesn't sound like a natural creature. Uh, do I have any idea what we might be dealing with here? Well, uh, somebody said they saw skeletons, so there may be some undead. Can Dogs they tell us where the skeletons are? Hind legs. Uh, hmm. Limey things that may or may not eat cats. Sounds huh. spooky. I have a fairly high intelligence. Would I possibly have any knowledge of what's going on with that? What it might be? Well, you haven't seen the tracks, so okay. Uh, so wow. they could be either. There's all kinds of creatures that have dog-like prints and walk on their hind <laughs> legs, such as canoles, uh, kobolds, okay, werewolves.
are they going to lead us or do they can they give us a map to where the cellar is uh they they tell you that there's a short path that leads directly to it okay they will not come with you oh man what time of day is it tell you that it smells horribly Mm, good to know Um, now, uh, fact is a, the children explain that they were playing in the woods and noticed a shiny object glimmering in the leaves. They brushed away the leaves and saw a silver handle on an old door. Wiping away the rest of the brush, they uncovered what they thought was a long lost food cellar. Yanking on the door, it opened with ease. A rush of air blew out with a smell unknown to them. Uh, oh. Children placed their heads in the opening and they heard noises, noises that grew louder and louder with each passing second. Uh, they didn't want to see the source of the smell and sounds, so they slammed the door and ran home as fast as they could. Cool. Um. Hmm. Is it daytime? It is daytime. It is around 10 a.m. The only prep I can think of is maybe tearing some, we could tear up some of the uh, cloth that we have, some of the, um, and me dampen it. Some of the winter blanket we could tear up and make into like strips to like put on our face with water to like dampen the smell. Okay. That sounds like a good idea. Mm. That's, a, That's a clever idea. That is. Mm. All right. Uh, otherwise, if we know where it is and it's close and it's daytime and we have holy water, uh, unless they're willing to give us any help, I think we're as good as we'll ever be. Okay. So, Any um, ideas? yes. All right. Oh, uh, JD, what was your character's name again? Andy. Andy. Got it. Cool. Sorry. Andy, do you have somebody's name written on the bo- bottom of your boot? No. <laughs> I was going to go with Andrew, but I shortened it. Okay. Besides, the name on the bottom of the boot is Andy, not the character name. In it. It's Woody yeah. who has Andy written on the bottom of his boot. Yeah. So, a short path leads to an open room that is lit just enough from the sunlight entering the cellar door. The path looks fleshly, freshly traveled with no visible cobwebs. The children's description of the smell did not do it justice. You notice bear tracks headed away from the entrance of the cellar and a single door that looks too complicated for an animal to open. Slime trails are seen throughout the room. So, this implies that you guys have gone 30 feet in and can see the room. What is your light source? I know the dwarf can see, but Andy the human cannot. I would use my flint and steel to ignite a torch and hold it hold it aloft so I can see. Okay. So you have your, are you holding the the torch in the same hand you're holding the shield? I would have to if I'm going to use my sword. Okay. Did the kids say if they went inside or did they just open the door and then they ran? They only opened the door and ran. They did not actually go inside. It smelled terrible and noises were coming at them. Give me one half second. I'm going to set something up for you real quick. Something's moving down here. Oh no! Oh no! Is it time to run away? Yeah. Always time. <laughs> I wonder if it's a creature we could just bring out into the sunlight.
according to the clock, I have 15 minutes before my break. It is my first break on the, on the clock. First break is at 1.55. So the yellow magnet sides of the room. Okay. How far away is that? That's 40 feet in. Can I see anything else in the room? Okay, since you're looking, um, notice you come up a little bit further. Look down there and you see that there is a Giant snail over there. Gross. And this snail is huge, almost 10 feet long, and it's got a Large tail, unlike most snails, with a club like appendage on the end. And it's sitting there going, boom, 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 boom. And I, I apologize. As soon as you came into the door, I was supposed to tell you the thump thumping. That I, is an ominous noise coming from a snail. Yes. I would, uh, I, from, from my pack. I'll take out my chalk and I'll crunch it up and I'll throw it on the floor to make a line okay. to block off the snail. Roll initiative. Yeah. Now initiative is a die six. Oh, that's right. Three. Four. Uh, you get to add your dex bonus if you have one. Yeah, that's a minus one. Four. <laughs> All right, you have a four. And who, what did the other one? Three. All right, so it is Max, Snail, and then AD. Huh. Max, come out and you rumble some chalk as a line to prevent him from crossing. Yeah, snails and slugs won't cross over chalk. Okay. At least in real life. <laughs> um, do you move at all? That was your action. Move. Can um, you cover a five foot I would try to try to cover the whole ten foot? I'll try to I'll move and I'll try to like cover a line as best I can. Okay. But like ahead of it, I want to keep my distance. So I guess we see the door in the back. I guess I'm going to try to make a border so that it will stop advancing towards us. So and that blue is your line. Cool. And yeah, you're done with your action. Then I will now move the snail. And it goes forward five, ten feet towards you. And that's all it can do.
Now, um, bumping its tail, looking around for something. JD, what are you doing? Huh. Well, I am a fighter. I am the basher. I guess I should uh, charge it and bash it. Okay. Run up on it. You swing your mighty sword. Do you drop your uh, torch? Are you trying to work um, with the I'll torch still the, in your I'll, head? I will drop the torch as I run. Hopefully okay. it'll stay lit. Get from him, like, okay, they have three dawns off. I will allow you to grab um, his torch as he like, okay. lets it go. That takes up your hand. So you will not be able to use your maul while you have the torch in hand. All right. Roll to hit. And that was a total roll of eight. Okay. So on the dice, you a rolled uh, a six. Yeah. All right. And that does not hit. I had a feeling. So you just kind of swish. You rolled too soon. Now, um, back up to Max. Roll every round. Do we roll a die six for to hit in this one, or is it still a d twenty? Well, it, you just, you just, you automatically. The initiative you got was what you one you keep. I can't oh, no, no. that in the rules. Thanks. Uh, the, to, to hit dice, do we use a d20 or also a d6? You roll a, d a die 20 to hit. Cool. Got it. What are you hitting it with? Your sling? Uh, I'll, I'll use the sling, yeah. Okay. Um, keeping my distance, I'll, I'll try to assist Andy by shooting a sling bullet. Okay, roll a die 20 uh, and add one to it. A five. <laughs> um, Andy is a little nervous. He thinks you might be shooting at him. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Andy. All right. It's okay. Nail. Um, attempts to bite you. Okay. Since you're directly in front of it. And. And it bounces off your shield. Get some slimy oh, stuff reveling over off your shield. JD. My turn. All right. Let's see what we got going. Come on. No whammies. All right, that would be a roll of 14 with the bonus. It is a 16. 16, you hit as you bite into that shield. How, I mean, yeah, Shell, how much damage do you do? Hang on. 1 die 8 plus 4. Plus 4? No, 1. Sorry. Plus 1, yeah. The see, plus I'll take and the it, 1 next no. to each other look like a 4. A 5. 5 nice. points of damage. Crack! A large crack appears in in the snail's um, armor of the shell. All right, Max, what are you gonna do? I'll try to shoot another sling bullet, but I'll try to shoot it inside the crack. Okay. I'll, I'll tell Andy if things get hairy, hop behind the chalk. <laughs> Uh, 13. 13. Clink. Hex, this time you hit the shell, but you didn't hit it with enough force to cause any damage. <laughs> yes. Clink. All Room right. for improvement. The snail whips around surprisingly fast for a creature that has a movement speed of 10 and swings that tail 
at poor defenseless Andy. <laughs> and hits him. Oh boy. For three points of damage. Okay, I'm dead. Uh, yeah, if, if he had hit you for one point of damage, you would have been dead. So he swings around, slaps you with his tail, and knocks you into the wall. And He hit and my glass jaw. Max, what are you doing? Um, I've got to get in there to bring Andy back up from zero. Um, can I use the 10-foot pole to just, like, jab into the hole? To try to, like, rattle up the inner bits? I of the will snail? allow you to attempt to stab it with your 10-foot pole. Roll to hit. Uh, a uh, ten. A ten. Uh, no, you you're like again clinking off its armor. You're like tap 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 with your weak little arms, and it does not uh, penetrate the sh the shell. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry, Andy. <laughs> so the snail just crawls over the dead body, gets right up to the. Th um, uh, the, the line and whips around and smacks you with its tail or attempts to smack you with its tail. Damn. Uh, and it misses. Smacking instead oh. the, the corner of the wall next to you. Crack! Looks like it would have hurt a lot if it had hit you. Hmm. Um. I'll attempt to uh, scurry around it and try to Pull Andy through the door. Okay. You try to move around it. Do -do 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 -do. Grab Andy. And try to drag him back out. Yeah. So uh, give me a roll of 20 side dice. I don't know that you're going to be able to do this. And get mm -hmm. less than your strength. Roll a one or a two or a three. Uh, rolled high this time. 17. Okay. Uh, you start grabbing and you're like pointing and you're like, oh, I should have done a push up first. And then, <laughs> uh, <laughs> since the snail is now facing you as you ran around to it, he attempts to bite you. And that hits your armor class exactly. Oh. Right. Breathe in. He does one point of damage to you as he bites oh. into you. He goes, ah, nom, 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 nom. You're all covered in Ooh. slime now. Do I have uh, any healing items or any healing? It. I don't know what the stabilizing rules are in this. There are none. Yeah. There are no negative hit points, and you do not have a healing potion, and you do not uh, have spells. So there's no way to bring back Andy. Just his memory. Oof. Um. If that's the case, uh, then I'll keep. I'll, I'll try to outrun the snail. Uh, I'll go for the door. Head for the door. Run away. Yeah, right. I'll try to drop some chalk behind me as I go. Hopefully this will slow him down. Takes a final swing at you and misses horribly, but does not Ooh. chase you out past the chalk. Mm. I assume you head back to the village. Yeah. All right, and perfect timing because it is now time for our first break, and we're exactly on time. So we'll be back in uh, 10 minutes. At um, two o five. Copy that. And then we'll start the lecture.
Hopefully we can find Andy's brave long lost brother who's also there for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> ah, intense. See you in a sec.
Welcome back to RPG Research Volunteer Training Meeting on Thing. Notice that flat first session was yes, not a TPK, but close. Um, the old school role playing games are a lot more unforgiving. They do not encourage hand-to-hand -hand combat, in my opinion. Or nor nor do they encourage combat in any. All right. Uh, okay. Role-playing games. Uh, one word term used to describe the emotional, psychological, and Physical states can transfer between real life and fantasy role playing games is bleed. Um, I'm going to put up a screen here. Hmm. I wanted <laughs> I do apologize. This uh, piece right here is not what it would be, but it's. Apologize for the delay. The link, uh, direct link, which should have opened up directly where it was supposed to, decided he didn't want to. All right, so it's not normal for me to share the workbook, but since this link here is not functioning, I'm going to show you the workbook anyways. Lead refers to the emotional, psychological, and physical states that can transfer between real life and fantasy. The fantasy could refer to a number of things, but here it refers to a role-playing game. As we see here, we have the self or the primary identity. 
uh, which is separated from the character or the alter ego by the magic circle and the social contract. In between those two things is the alibi. The deeper you are into character, the deeper your immersion is. Anything that's that is caused by you that affects what happens to your character is called bleed in. Anything that happens in the game that affects you as a real person is called bleed out. There's good bleed and bad bleed. We will go over these things more a little bit later. Um, Out of game thoughts can also be interwoven with emotional responses. I can't believe Johnny is insulting my character. He always acts this way when the player play together, which may later introduce an angry outburst in character. Um, relationship dynamics and things like that can also have those kind of impacts. An example of leads are two players who are best friends out of game they may unconsciously replicate that dynamic when in magic circle so their characters in game are also best friends i have a couple players who are one moment all right i have um two characters that in real life are married and in the game they're married. Uh, so the, the fact that they're married is impacting their character choices, uh, which is bleed in. I've had characters who were married, they weren't playing married characters in game. But when a love interest in game showed up for the in game ca player character of the male character, the actual married one um, got jealous. Her jealousy was bleeding into the game and m created making her uh, make decisions that literally got the entire party killed. Oh, that's um, lovely. Well, what happened was she tried to take the ex-girlfriend character because the um, NPC was an ex-girlfriend of the PC prior to the player characters getting married. Wow. So she took the um, NPC girlfriend aside and went to get her on the next uh, stagecoach out of the town just because of their prior relationship in game. Uh, it turns out, though, that the NPC ex girlfriend was actually a wolfware, which is like cross a werewolf with a doppelganger. Okay. So it really wasn't the ex girlfriend. So as soon as she got them alone, Killed the player uh, player character, and then I handed the player the stats for the wolfware and says, "You now get to be the monster." <laughs> but then when got the next person alone, and killed natural Everybody got killed. <laughs> yep, that, that's a that's a wonderful natural consequence too. Yeah, and each person as they got killed got to take over the monster. <laughs> Until finally, the last person figures it out just before he gets his rip, throat ripped out. <laughs> oh, that, that's actually an awesome TPK right there. I think it's my best TPK, period. Because <laughs> they literally did it to themselves. Yep. Uh, that's pretty stellar. Mm. Now, physical yeah. states can... Now, we've talked a little bit about how emotional states can impact in-game. Um, you... You're grumpy, so your character acts more grumpy. Um, acts a little ir more irrational than it normally does. You're playing a Vulcan who suddenly has a temper tantrum. <laughs> <You know. laughs> 
But physical states can also produce bleed, especially sleep deprivation or exhaustion, which weakens the mental defenses of the players and makes them more susceptible to impulse, impulsive emotional responses. Many games such as high immersion combat LARPs are built around this principle, though the designers may not realize that they're creating a game designed to produce a bleed effect. Another type of bleed turns to ego bleed by Whitney Strix Beltran. Ego bleed occurs when the contents of the player's personality spills over to the character and vice versa. Uh, I am a above average intellect who is good at problem solving and has 21 years of military training, so naturally takes leadership roles. But I'm supposed to be playing a shy halfling uh, with a nine intelligence. It can be hard. <laughs> Yeah, I, I have that trouble, too, with parties. We're currently doing Star Wars 5th Edition with my son, and my natural inclination is to be the leader of the party. And I have to really stop myself from doing that. I really have a problem with that when I'm doing a military game like Twilight 2000, where I am literally in real life the expert, and yep. I have to pretend not to be. <laughs> that's not how that works okay yeah this effect is most measurable when uh, players claim to have learned skills from their in-game experiences that, beca that become useful in reality such as leadership, se seduction, etc uh, oh. so it does work the other way uh, Yeah. we use role-playing games to teach people social skills that they can go out mm. and function with in real life uh, we've used role-playing games to teach science skills, which people can go out and use in real life. That is bleed out and uh, is good. Now, I had a little bit of that in our section. With uh, I feel a very common theme in my gameplay as a player is using items in unconventional ways. And in real life, Max is an environmental scientist knowing that that's actually a gardener's trick to stop snails and slugs by using a line of chalk is probably something that a cleric dwarf would not know unless he's a gardener. Well, a uh, cleric well, might be a gardener because that is a traditional um, activity for clerics. Um, possible. While, while they're getting their training. Mm. Um, giant cave snails may have been a problem in your thing. But when you... <laughs> uh, in your caves. But... When you start going, well, I'm going to take some saltpeter, an iron, and uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're going to invent gunpowder now. Yeah, it's thanks. real quick. Just gonna invent guns while I'm at it, real quick. You know, I think I can kind of, kind of uh, roll with it. <laughs> Lose train of thought. Uh. Okay, according to Bleed Theory, the imaginary boundary between the player's self-identity and the player character that created the rules, identity and currencies within the role-playing game session is known as the magic circle. That's the inherent distinction between you as a player and your character, because uh, you're not actually the same person. We like to try to keep those separated uh, by using character voices and uh, using our pronouns more appropriately. For example, I walk up and mash the giant snail with my hammer. Or did Bobo the clown with his uh, giant rubber hammer go up and smash the giant snail? My character goes and does this, as opposed to I go and do this. My character um, doesn't like what he hears. He is going to move in and attack. Those things that keep us separate helps control bleed. But sometimes when we're trying to get that immersive feeling, we may try to smudge that magic circle a little bit. Like uh, we're doing a horror story. In order to get you to be scared, I want you to kind of smudge that magic circle and refer to your character as you. I do this. I do that. 
to allow more bleed in. That way you can get properly scared. Um, we, we have a whole thing on, uh, that I'll be doing a lecture on later, not during this course, but uh, later, later um, on proper use of horror in role-playing games. The, uh, set of rules that agreed upon by all participants how to interact with each other in and out of characters, such as no real life touching, day and character or the duration of the session, when a player throws a red foam packet, it symbolizes a fireball, etc., is called the social contract. When we enter a game from the outside, we adopt a new set of social rules, both implicit and explicit. These social rules function on an in-character level. That is, this form, form of worship is actually a spaceship. When a character throws a packet, it's a fireball. When a player sneaks, they are portraying, when the player speaks, they are portraying a noblewoman, not their real world profession, etc. Out of game social rules also play. We'll stay in character for the duration of the experience. We'll avoid touching, touching without permission. We'll observe safe words when in used. Such of these rules make up the social contract of the game. When the social contract is established, players can enter the safety of the magic circle. So, when the player stabs the other player, that is a breaking of the social contract. Their characters should be stabbing each other, not the players. Please and thank you. <laughs> Always important to note. <laughs> Perhaps the most important aspect of the social contract is the alibi, in which the players accept the premise that the actions in the game are taken by the player character and not by the player. Hawk has, and this is called the alibi, as I mentioned. So Hawk has an example where he was playing an NPC who was snotty, gruff, and um, rude. And he is standing up to his full six foot, 100 feet, looming down at this little girl saying, I don't like you. I am going to crush you. And she's literally about to break down te tears. Why are you being so mean? Oh, oh, no, no. That's the character. I'm not doing that. The character is saying that to your character. We're all friends here. <laughs> so that's the line yeah. between the social contract and the magic circle. The idea uh, representing the other player character and not the player self. This allows you to make choices that you wouldn't do. Like jump across a chasm to grab a free-floating chain looking down at the lava below. You might not do that in real life, but your player would. Uh, that's my character's choice, not mine. Uh, most important facet of the social contract is the alibi. Um, phrases like, it wasn't me, it was my character, it's what my character would have done, are a direct result of the benefit of the ally, alibi. In principle, no individual is responsible for their actions in character uh, if those events could untold possibly within fiction. This is not to say that you should not use your, that you should use your character to abuse or uh, perpetuate behavior that is socially unacceptable within your game. I'm chaotic evil. Of course I will burn down the church and uh, molest all the nuns as they come running out. Or I'm going to do horrible things to your player character. Uh, you know, the alibi is there to protect but it cannot you got to be careful not to abuse the alibi and the it, social contract i think seems to work hand in hand with that alibi to keep that from happening right yes that's why it's uh the alibi is in between the social contract and the magic circle all right um alibi is a direct correlation with bleed the stronger the alibi the weaker the bleed uh, so, uh, 
if I have a real good separation between myself and the character, character is nothing like me. Uh, everybody's fully aware that no matter what that character does, I'm not at fault. Um, I am personally not to be uh, lambasted or hated for. For example, when I'm the dungeon master, I have a real strong alibi between me and my monsters and the villains. Uh, my villains are supposed to be horrible people. It doesn't make me the horrible person, right? So there's Correct. little bleed between me and the villain in my thing. Uh, if there isn't a strong alibi, there's more pass through for bleed. Uh, playing close to home provides inherently weaker alibi. For example, if a player has children in real life, playing a parent in game will likely produce greater bleed and lesser alibi. Two players that are married to each other and are played married in game may end up using the game to work out things that are being a problem in their real life. So really cutting, you know, increasing the bleed uh, by not having a full alibi between their two characters. Player may strengthen the alibi by establishing very different relationship dynamics between the character and the fictional children, therefore affording added distance. Ultimately, the player can choose to push towards greater degree of lead by using the real names of his or her children in that game. Um, I can see where that could go wrong. But I can also see where it could be beneficial in a therapeutic setting. All right, according to bleed theory, the self is also known as the primary identity, which is the real world person or persona rather than the imaginary character. You saw where that was on the diagram. The imaginary persona that used within the game itself is known as the player character in most role-playing games. Uh, there are some role-playing games that give it different names, like the actor, the agent, the avatar. Beat theory uh, the belief theory, this is also referenced to as the alter ego of the participant. Not to be mistaken for Bruce Wayne and Batman, which, which all knows that Bruce Wayne is the alter ego to Batman. The FRBG's initialism for basic fantasy role-playing game. Role-playing is hyphenated. And you can find it at basicfantasy.org. That's basic-fantasy.org. This was created by Chris Donnerman. It has a vibrant online support community forum. And the reasons that we like it is accessibility. It's got a clean layout, screen reader friendly, disabilities friendly, and low income friendly. Uh, clear causality, covered in the later sessions about old school versus new school and Causality of learning. The closer you are to um, cause and effect, the better. As you saw, uh, monster hit player character, player character die. That was a really close uh, cause and effect cycle there. A portable print version means our requirements for physical copies uh, meet. We have a requirement in RPG research that everything that we um, try to introduce and use in our programs is available as a physical element that you can actually go and buy it. Uh, but their print versions are between $3 and $6 per book. So this book here cost $3. Wow. They make no profit Ow. on this yeah. print on demand. They make zero profit on these. Um, in fact, on the back of them, there's a there's an explanation of what the book is. This is old school, and then they get right here and it says, "Don't buy this book." Well, not yet, anyways. The basic fantasy role playing game rules are available for free on our website, basicfantasy.org. 
You know, I think Hawk may have an error in there with that hyphen. Somebody pull up basicfantasy.org with the hyphen in and see if it actually comes up with anything. There you will also find adventures, alternate rules, and other supplementary materials to enhance your game. So you can get it for free. They encourage you to get it free. And if you want to have a physical book, they will sell it to you for the minimum possible price. And they come in multiple forms. This book is available in hardback, uh, slightly more price, uh, spiral bound, so they can lay it flat, or uh, standard paperback like this. Not saddle stitched or anything like that, it's glued in. All right. Um, Easily Customize provides ODT source files, kind of like Word, but it's uh, open source. Making it easy to customize, and it's available both electronic PDF free and physical formats at low cost. We are working on creating a Beckme version of the basic fantasy rules so that you have a solo adventure and then a guided solo. Uh, so you have a choose your own adventure style beginning, solo adventure book style, but it's going to be module format. And then a solo adventure module, which is going to actually, as you're going through, teach you how to play this by yourself before you even see anybody else. And then a walkthrough on how to be a dungeon master. This doesn't do that right what? now. What's Beckney? Beckney oh, sorry. It's basic expert companion. Masters, Immortals, and that is uh, oh, yes. 1983 Dungeons and Dragons, basic through Immortal set uh, with Frank Menzer. Mm. Now, bonus points for this program uh, for the for the BFRPG is active community support, clean, accessible layout. Uh, which goes in our accessibility and available in many languages. Get it still for free. I cut you off there, JD. Were you saying something? Sorry about that. Um, I was just going to say there is no hyphen in the URL. That's what I thought. I'm going to have to remind Hawk of that. And what was the eighth bonus answer? Available um, in you many have... languages. Okay. Mm. All right. Nine. According to Bleed Theory, when the real world emotions, thoughts, relationship dynamics, and physical states of the players have an effect on the player character, this is known as Bleed In. So, I mean, for me, who my character is into the circle. Whereas the events in the game that have an effect on the real world player during or after the game is known as bleed out. The fact that I learned some social skills and I'm able to implement it in my real life is an example of bleed out. Bleed feedback loop is also observable when it comes difficult to tell where the player begins and the character ends, especially in emotionally overwhelming situations. Or actors who have gone a little too method. For example, in games where players experience sleep deprivation and constant attacks from enemies, the exhausted mind may have difficulty distinguishing between a fake attack and a real one. But anonymous does not mean the player is incapable of holding the magic circle, but rather that the intensity of emotion is becoming overwhelming to the mind, causing confusion and difficulties with immediate processing and distancing. This is yet another reason we mandate regular breaks in all of our programs. Ten, what is our most important tools to help manage voicing between your own PCs and NPCs over the years and between many different groups? Three by five index cards with voice cards, file box, or some other management system. There are many ways, different ways to track voicing attributes, but the classic 3x5 index card approach is a tried and true approach that doesn't get accidentally deleted 
incompatible with different phones, computers, etc. It doesn't require batteries, powers, internet, etc. And we will talk about that in our voicing lecture coming up. So double check on the time. It is 2.36. And we... We have a little time before our next break to talk about the tools and skills on, on how to do voicing. Because uh, this will be applying to our next applied uh, gaming part. Uh, right now, we're going to create our first voice. And we're going to pull out an index card if you have one, or a piece of scratch paper or something. And we're going to put some items on them. We do a full workshop. Uh, we do three full workshops for levels two, level five, and level 10 trainees. This is a warm up precursor to the full workshop. And there will be a voice test at the end of the session. First, uh, fundamentals of the voice. Uh, extension of your body, health, posture. You are your whole instrument. So your posture, how you're sitting, your diaphragm, your shoulders, whether they're forward or back, head up, down, middle, round. Uh, your jaw, whether I'm clenching my jaw like this or keeping my mouth wide and open and ready to roll my words. Hips, the way I'm standing, sitting, legs, etc. All of this body, from top to bottom, down to your feet, um, will have an impact about your voice. Uh, projection and enunciation. Um, starving poor actors joke. You must learn to enunciate. Clearly, and project your voice loudly so you can be heard to say from the back of the room, Yes, I am eligible for food stamps. You project with your diaphragm and moving your voice uh, loudest and volume. This is an advanced technique directing one's voice effectively with projection. Enunciation. How? Clearly, you are speaking the words, saying each word individual, not mumbling them together like there's some kind of boom power. Yeah, you know what I mean. Uh, and how well you enunciate is a character choice as well. I am the snooty butler, and I will say every word exactly perfect. I, I, I've been just here talking here, and I don't know all these good words. These are all these big words that you're sitting throwing at me. I don't know what to do about them. Um, or you can give your character a lisp or anything else like that. But um, enunciation is important so that you're understood. Most people tend to rush, especially during performance. Slow it down. It may feel like you're going way too slow, especially when your adrenaline is pumping. But most likely, it isn't too slow. Even if it is a little too slow, which is very rare, it tends to really stand out for most people as more dramatic. Different people swear by different ones for food and drink considerations. Some say hot, some say cold, some say from a pot nine days old. Some like water with lemon juice, others tea, others milk. I stay away from milk because I don't want to produce the phlegm. But some people, that's what they want to do. They want to smooth down the acid and, and make it so they can talk more smoothly. Figure out how your body works and what works best for you. It's very different for individual. Uh, you must stay hydrated. But yeah, not clicking. Back in your lips. Unless that's your character. And maybe that's what you want to do. So let's talk about filling out your voice card. Uh, this is the most basic version. Uh, we're going to cover a fraction of these. Full list is handled in full workshops. So the first one we're going to do is a voice 
title. Now you can write down your character's name as the voice title, or you can write down to try to make it more generic. Uh, new fighter or young fighter. Uh, holy dwarf. Whatever your things. I want you to make these out for your current character you're playing right now. So whatever title lets you realize that's who you want to be. I am playing omelet. Then uh, uh, do that, or make a description of it so you can use that type of character again when that type of character shows up again. Okay. All right. Uh, primary pitch frequency. Next thing you're going to do dynamics. Three, four is volume decibels. Five is your rate, how fast you're talking. Uh, six is timber, distinctive tones. Seven is accent, and eight is catchphrase. So when you've got those numbered down there, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, we'll go into explaining what each one of those make. All right, so voice title. Make sure it's clear and useful. The more distinct, the better. Salty Pirate is rather generic, but Bob the Salty Pirate with a lisp and French accent is much more useful at a glance. Voice title examples include Gruff Innkeeper, Boisterous Bard, um, SBD Cowboy, a la la Clint Eastwood, etc. Uh, primary number two is your primary pitch and range. Anybody have questions so far? Please, I notice you guys don't interrupt me during uh, lectures, but if you have questions, yeah. please do so. Oh, absolutely. I will ask. Likewise. Primary pitch and pitch range in singing examples would be tenor versus brass. Or bass, sorry. Tenor versus bass. All about the bass. Soprano versus contralto. Contra contra Higher pitch range, lower pitch range. Deep. Voice. This is the high pitch voice and the frequency. Oh, oh. The frequency range in hertz, bottom end, the most human hearing is 20 hertz. Looking for the the farm the most variable, especially with age, is 20,000 hertz. Don't forget about falsetto, male or female, very high pitch. A lot of people rather. Aim low rather than high. Falsetto with practice can be almost as much range as a regular voice. If you've seen Fran Drazer and how she talks, you know, with practice, she can get that full range of talking like this. Well, it'd be quaint whisper to her. I told you so. Uh, now, dynamics, flat or dynamic range. Monotone versus high variability in any of the variables, especially pitch. But don't forget other variables that can be dynamic or flat as well. Monotone. Monotone versus high variability in any of the variables, especially pitch. But don't forget the other variables can often be dynamic or flat as well. High variable. Monotone versus High variability in any of the variables, especially pitch. But don't forget the other variables that can be dynamic or flat as well. See the difference? Yeah. It's something I'll have to practice, though. Right. Uh, when you talk normally, you normally have different inflections in your voice to emphasize different words over other things. Monotone, you're a robot. Blah, blah, blah. Absolutely, absolutely. Great, speed of speech. Critical to take your time. Most people go too quickly. We already mentioned this before, but let me give you an example. I am Captain James Tiberius. The famous Shatner pause. Right. Versus the. I'm really good at talk, uh, stop talking. When, it, when I'm told to shut up, I shut up. But another, not another word is said. I'm really quick. These variables that we put in our rate of speech should be an intentional choice. Uh, 
remember, the faster you go, the more you have to work on your enunciation because you become harder and more mumbled and, and become indistinct to tell. But if I'm playing a character that's quick and nervous, I might want to speed up my speech. Hear that? Okay, timber. Pronounce timbre. I will always mispronounce it. Amber. Distinct tones, overtones, etc. The combination of variables that give the overall recognizable sound. For example, the timbre of a violin is distinctive from that of a piano. There's a lot of variables in this, and we cover those in four workshops. The key is to know that as an overall phrase often ties in with the voice title. Like we mentioned up there, uh, the list or uh, other voice qualities that you want. I have a quick question. Yes. Um, this is a new lesson to me, and I'm also not particularly music-minded. Uh, is there a good reference for what these sort of phrases would mean in terms of a voice? Uh, if, if falsetto. Or, yeah, like a falsetto didn't have an inherent meaning to me. Okay. Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, let me see if I have a. I will. Could I like look up like a sheet? I will ask Hawk for one of those. Um, I will put in some videos for you to watch. Uh, that will talk more about these different voice things. Um, uh, other than Googling music notation or something like that. That would probably be inherently valuable because, like, I do a couple of voices for my games, but, like, I don't have the verbiage to really describe them. And I think if I, like, it's interesting to, the first stuff that you started with is really interesting. I think, like, my posture and what I'm drinking and, like, that has a very, uh, that's very layperson terms that make sense for when I'm doing voices. Uh, but it'd be interesting to get into some of the more deeper things and know how to actually, like, describe what you mean, like, with a falsetto or what have you. Um, so I'll do some Googling as well. All right. You should... All right. There you go. There's some links to some YouTube videos to watch. Um, but I will make a definite note of that, that we should have a vocabulary uh, resource to send people to on that. Okay. Thank you very much. That uh, Hawk, yes. uh, two notes for this. Uh, your link to uh, basicfantasy.org has a hyphen in it, and actual link does it's not. not and it's adjusted for the voice thing that we have a place to send people for a vocabulary. If they don't know what uh, falsetto and amber and all those other words mean, if they don't have a music background, a music vocabulary for things like falsetto yeah. and Oh, I went too far. Back to where I was. Okay, we're talking accents next. Any language besides your own, not required. <laughs> There's only one so far, if, if we're not going to well, make a note. <laughs> we'll do. That, that was the idea. Yeah. Well, 
Okay. Oh, I wasn't planning on us writing it. <laughs> All right. Um. All right, where was it? Accents. Uh, you have a lot of voices without accents. You can do all kinds of voices without actually utilizing an accent. Uh, no accent. I am now talking with a deeper voice. And I'm talking. Uh, it almost sounds like I'm using an accent because I've changed the tone of my voice. But I'm not using one. I'm still not using an accent. I'm just locking my jaw together so it makes me sound like this. Um, but everyone has an accent. Uh, North Idaho is supposed to be the least accented place in the uh, United States, as in, like, we speak, or they, I'm no longer North Idaho, speak closer to the dictionary pronunciation of the words than most other places. What do you mean my word changes? I'm <laughs> saying you weren't a good talker. I'm just saying you're not doing it right. <laughs> All right, anyways. It's um, my family. I, I grew up. Oh, no, what? You've lived here your whole life. It's Washington. <laughs> so, um, you can find out more about accents and how to do different accents by looking them up on YouTube, by going to our later workshops. They're not required to have an accent, but if you think you can pull off an accent, go ahead and incorporate it in your character. Aye, I'm going to be a right good pilot. Um, key phrases that help, uh, the last thing is your catchphrase. Key phrase that helps you immediately jump into character. Now, Peter Jurassic uh, played the character on Babylon 5 known as L Lando Morale, Mo Molari. And he would use the key phrase, Mr. Garibaldi, to jump right into his character and get the correct voicing. I use other catchphrases to try to get into other accents. Guten Tag, Vigetia. Yeah, well, I, would, I, I will say a couple words in German to get me to start talking like I'm a German person. And we have ways of making you talk. Tick, talk, tick. So you might want to come up with a catchphrase for your character that immediately gets you into character. I can talk like this, and it's like, I haven't really changed my voice that much other than... You should see what she does with caffeine. <laughs> oh, uh, what questions do you guys have about those eight things? Um... Can I just quickly get the list of all eight? Uh, yeah, I'll go over the list, quickly. and then I'm Thank going you. to when we um, get back into after our break, we're going to do more applied gaming, and I want you to actually use your voices. Um, I will allow you to change out your equipment, and I will allow JD to re-roll his hit points. And make it a new character just so it can get into it faster. Oh, okay. But you see, you can reroll your hit points and you can right change out your equipment if you want to. But other than that, you want to keep the same character and just hit back in. All right, so okay, the basic variable yeah. tracks on your card one is your voice title, <clears throat> two is the primary pitch, three is dynamics, four is your volume. Five is your rate or speed. 
Six is timbre. Seven is your accent, if any. And eight is your catchphrase. Anybody have any questions about those? Not at this time, no. All right. At um, four oh five, I will want to start us again. Copy that. And we will start oh. with um, continued applied gaming. Um, I will at the very first ask you to read to me your cards. And then we will uh, go ahead and play with you using your voices when you talk to each other and the townsfolk. Sounds good.
here. All right, welcome back to RPG Research Volunteer Training Meeting Online. We have so far did our uh, baseline quiz. We did some applied gaming, uh, took a break of course, uh, did our RPG theory lecture on the topic of bleed, and we talked about voice, uh, you know, the baseline lessons of how to do voice. Uh, what I did not cover in the baseline uh, thing of the voice was why? Well, bleed uh, is one of the reasons uh, so that you can get more into character, so a positive bleed into your character's thing. Uh, distinguish between, help and support the alibi, between when I am talking to you, as I am right now, and when Bogar the Barbarian is talking to you, yeah. We want to have that separation, so I have that alibi. No, Volgar smash face. John Wilker, not touch you. He's sitting over here on the other side of the table. He didn't touch you at all. Uh, and as for a dungeon master, it's even more important to have these voices because when I have, Hi, I'm Princess Parabina, and this is my friend. Hi. I'm friend. Uh, you now know the difference between those two people. So when, what you doing there? You don't have to know anything else. That that's friend talking. And when the other says, "Can I have some candy?" You know that's Princess Terabina. I don't have to actually say Princess Terabina says, and friend says, this, that, and the other thing. And you don't can't tell the difference between character A and character B. All right. Back to the game, and the uh, first part I want in the game is I would like to ask um, JD, what is your, uh, read me your eight slots on your card. All right. So this is the hardest part for me. Um, character voicing has always been difficult because I'm very self conscious about using accents when I don't really understand the accent to begin with. And so you don't have to. Uh, one, one of the oh, really yeah. great things about doing a role-playing game, a fantasy role-playing game set in uh, a world that doesn't exist. Yeah, my Irish accent's a little pokey, but guess what? I'm talking like a leprechaun from the land of tarot, and this is how they talk. It's not actually yeah. Ireland. Oh, I understand that. I it, do. It's hard to get it wrong when you're when there's no right. <laughs> yeah, I I understand that. It's it's still a self conscious type thing that's going on with me. It is. Um, um, but for my card, um, the description is going to be for the character name, of course. So that's Andy. Um, I'm going to be using my particular pitch because that's the easiest for me at this point. Um, same for the dynamics. Um, I'm not flat. I'm not overly dynamic. So I think that'll fit. Um, volume for me is the same. I'm going to probably pit, uh, probably pick it up just a little bit for projecting into the microphone because my gain is down a bit. Um, the rate is going to be a touch faster than mine, but not uh, not much. Again, because that's what I'm comfortable with. Uh, same with the timber. It's going to be about the same. Timber. And I think I can get away with a Southern Scotland accent. Okay. Um, I knew some people from there, and I... Um, so I'm going to try that. All right. So that's how I'm going to distinguish when you are talking versus when your character is talking. I'll be listening to that slightly faster Southern Sco Scottish accent. Aye. All right. And um, Max... What um what does your card say? Uh just leaning into the, the idea that I would know about the chalk. I, I said the voice tone would be like a nervous gardener. <laughs> okay. Nervous uh, gardener. With, with a high and kind of raspy pitch. Um I'm I'm kind of learning. I'm, I thought I guess for dynamics, maybe like kind of a quivering voice, if that's the right use of the word. Uh, medium volume, uh, a normal rate or speed. Uh, I didn't really know what to use for timber. 
So uh, when you were talking about earlier, that's your dynamic range versus mm. monotone versus I low and change. I don't know how it's going to go. <laughs> or personality. Got it. Uh, so I guess it would, they could get pretty broad if like there's danger. Okay. So decently broad. Um, I don't. Want, hmm. I haven't really decided on an accent. I think I'm just that's enough pieces that I could kind of just like hodgepodge an accent that I don't have like a okay. an armed reach name for. Yep. Um. Uh, for a catchphrase, uh, I thought I was gonna do something like uh, "Even roots can run." <laughs> All right, so let me hear that. Let me hear your catchphrase in your character's voice. Uh, even roots can run. All right. And let me hear, um, JD, your catchphrase. There we go. I've got to turn the, uh, the mic on. I did forget to say that one. That's just a wee slip of a creature, isn't it? There you go. That's just a wee slip of a character. Our ca creature. Yes. <laughs> just a wee slip of a creature. It's just a wee thing, you know. Back to the story. I can't thank you enough for coming along when you did. I mean, I don't think we would have survived. So why don't you just go on down there to that uh, entrance and see what's going on? We appreciate your help. A short path leads to an open room and is lit just enough from the sunlight entering the cellar door. The path looks freshly traveled with no visible cobwebs. The children's description of the small smell did not do it justice. You notice bear tracks headed away from the entrance of the cellar, and a single door that looks too complicated for an animal to open. Slime trails are seen throughout the group. What would you like to do? What would you like to say to each other? To clarify, are we like doing a, a rewind? Um, or do we have the knowledge of what happened before and we're trying Your to- Your character has the knowledge, and if you told him, then he has yeah. the knowledge. Why don't you tell him in character what happened to the other guy? Uh, what's your new yeah. character's name? Oh, I gotta change my name. Barrett. <laughs> Did you say Eric? Nice. Barrett. 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 With a B. Uh, I, I scramble out of the cellar. B-A-R-R-E-T. Barrett, okay. Barrett! So, explain to Barrett what happened to uh, your friend Andy. Andy. Oh, I, I, I'm glad to have found you, Barrett. I, there's, I'm gonna have to say, former friend. I tried my best, but there's a massive snail there, among other things. It's a, uh, it's pretty mad, Gab, in there. I did my best to hold my ground, but I had to dart out. I'm glad we've got reinforcements, but I think we should probably pick up some salt. It's looking like a mess in there. Ah, oh, some salt. So, uh, what do we use the salt for, eh? There's a snail as big as a caboose in there, as big as a cow. <laughs> ah, yes, I remember being a boy and playing with salt and snails. It wasn't very nice, so I, I kind of understand what you're saying. <laughs> uh, that's Max. <laughs> Who's doing the Rick and Morty voice? <laughs> Love it. Yeah, I read that. I was like, accents of any is, is Morty. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, now that is something you can write under accent. You can pr yeah. put on there, Clint Eastwood, or mm. whoever you're <laughs> trying to imitate. Got it. Uh, if we don't want to befall the fate of my former friend Andy, and I can't emphasize enough, former. Morden rest his soul. I think we should maybe get a couple more supplies. It looks like there's more to come than just that snail. I, I could probably use some rope as well. Mm. 
All right, does anybody need to, uh, have, do you have equipment you need to buy? Do you have the books there? You can buy it right out of the, the equipment list. Yep. Did I don't you know change your basic data. load uh, as the warrior? Uh, no, not at all. Okay. Could we ask the town for salt, or is this like medieval style where salt is actually very expensive and rare? Salt is expensive. Uh, let me check the uh, rule book to see if they even have it listed. Hmm. I'm trying to think what's salt esque. Well, there Maybe are all kinds of salts. Hmm. Mm hmm. Oh, I know what I need. I have a book here. Oh, basic fantasy, basic, basic fantasy equipment emporium. Another resource. Neat. All right. So, not weapons, armor, general equipment, cooking, rations. That might probably be under there. Animal services, stock and trade goods. Drinks, cooking, and provisions. Probably under. Okay, so we're starting 38. Salt. One pound is one gold piece. And I would assume that would be a block of salt, not pre-ground. Correct. Or no. right, it would be ground, but chunky it. ground. Mm. That too, yeah. Mm. I failed to save my friend Andy, but I feel penances to buy you the salt that might help avenge him. I'll buy two pounds, one for each of us. Okay. Maybe you could even salt your a weapon. Rock salt. Two pounds of rock Ooh. salt coming up. Now, if you only I had a shotgun. That. Was that? But now, if you only had a shotgun. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we could use little nuggets of it in our sling there. Yeah. Now we're thinking. That's a great idea. Are you ready to venture in? Aye. All right. We go down, fully aware that there is a bad guy. Same colors as before. This time he's oh. moved over to here. When you come in and you see him there, you got a torch there for light. And oh. the light coming in from the, 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 the thing, so it's a little bit lit up. Uh, roll initiative. Aye. <laughs> Oh, wait, that's right. Wrong one. Remember, when you're talking as in yourself, use your regular yeah. voice. When you're talking for your character, use your character's voice. Is Andy's body still there, or was he eaten? No, Andy's body is still there. A, a little more desiccated and slimed. Maybe a few chunks taken out. Yep, yep, yep. You ever How seen gruesome. a snail eat? It's Kind of scary looking. It is. It's not pleasant. So, uh, anybody got a six or higher? No. Five or higher? No. Four? Uh, five. Okay. What did you get, JD? I have a one. You got the wrong password. Uh, 
All right, am I still broadcasting now? We can see you and hear you. Yeah, the question is, am I still on YouTube? Uh, oh, right. let me go check. All right, since Max broke the internet. My bad. You shouldn't have done that with that glass of champagne. I was having too much yeah. fun. We did a brief character uh, uh, montage where we talked about battle tactics and character. <laughs> nice. I'm glad you guys did that in character. Yeah. So, Max, uh, yeah. it's time you implement that um, montage into action. What are you going to actually do now? It's your turn. Uh, we're going to try to beeline to the door, uh, thinking that we're faster than the snail. Uh, maybe engage from it at distance at best, but not <laughs> take the most direct route to the door that doesn't walk right in front of the All snail. Right. Are you going maybe to right. attempt to move 20 feet or 40 feet? Maybe 40 feet, like along the edge of the room. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree with that. All right. So, but you can only move either 20 and then have an action, or you can move yeah. 40 and that's your max move. Yeah, maybe like, uh, maybe if we hug the walls, go counterclockwise, and it will hopefully follow us very slowly. We can outpace it. <laughs> Just okay. keep dashing like five, ten, five, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, thirty, thirty-five, forty, fifteen, Or do we want to go clockwise or maybe clockwise or counterclockwise? I can't, uh, I guess it would be, we'd be farther away if we went clockwise rather than counterclockwise. You could go both. Oh, yeah. Let's do that. Let's do that. <laughs> okay. Uh, snail's turn. Five, ten. <laughs> oh. So. I need Kiss coming in towards Max. Gross. And it miraculously misses you. Oh, that one's for Andy. So, um, what does better do? Make a run for it. Barrett is going to charge in, and um, I don't believe there's any there are any rushing rules in this particular rule set. So he's just going to charge in as fast as he can up to the creature, and they're going to have to do battle with it since it's right there. Okay. 5, 10, 15 feet. You move right up to him. And you notice along its side, there is a sizable crack in a shell. I have a 20 speed, so I can actually attack. Yes, you can, because you only moved 15 feet. Yeah, so I will do that. It was a salty sword, Barrett. I rolled a 10. I get a plus two to my attack, so that's a total of 12. Okay. Uh, was this with your sword? Just with my sword, yes. Okay. Clang went the bell. Or clang, clang went the yeah. shell. I got its Take attention that. for you. And, um... What's your new hit points, by the way? Five. Okay. Max. What are you going to do? Um, how far is it to the door? According uh, to my map, one. you have 5, 10, 15, 20 feet to the door. Is there disengage? Uh, is there opportunity attacks in this version of the game? There are not opportunity yeah. attacks in this version. I'll run to the door. Um, I'll stand in the door frame and I'll try to do a. I can use 20 movement to get there and then I'll try to hit it with a rock salt sling. Okay. okay. Run up there and you turn around to back to the door and throw salt. A <laughs> two. <laughs> All right. That one wasn't You're very high. high. You're not supposed to throw the salt over your shoulder. 
So you put it in the little thing, you slug it around, and you smack it against the door. Flap! Oh. Oh! Maybe I should take a few inches further from the door. Anyways. The snail that has got his back to you already brings up that stumping tail and swings it down. And your armor class is 16? Yes, it so is. Quickly step aside to dodge it as it goes slam. <laughs> JD, what are you doing? Um, well, Barrett is going to attack since he's right up next to him. Okay. I'm going to slice you in half. There you go. Not with the seven, though. Well, it's seven plus two. two. It's a nine. Nine. Still, yeah, that's not going to do it. Clang. Don't be a hero, Barrett. Keep running. <laughs> Just hit him with assault. Okay, Max, what are you going to do? Uh, if Barrett refuses to leave, I'll try to keep backing him up. I'll, uh, I'll do another salt, uh, salt sling. Um, I'm trying to think of anything that would be more helpful. Um, can I, I try, try to... Salt. Okay. I will give it a shot. Uh, 14. You hit his shell and salt scatters. You didn't hit anything <laughs> soft. Is there still a crack in the shell? There's still a crack in the shell that's near the back. Uh, but you had the full face to hit and you just kind of flung it wild. Mm -hmm. At least you hit his shell this time. That's true. That's true. All right. Um, should I, maybe I'll try, start trying to move towards Andy's body, like in a diagonal. Okay. I can still probably stay in shooting range, but I'll I'll start moving towards where Andy's body was. Maybe he has a solution to this. Even in death, he's still helping us. If that's at 20 feet. You want to move? Oh, well, you already threw something. So that's as far as you're getting. That's good. Thank you. All right. Don't know if we're still broadcasting. Can somebody check the broadcast to see if we're actually playing? Yes, we are. Okay. I can see it on YouTube right now. Good, 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 good. All right. Uh, so the, the snail turns towards your movement like it's going to come after you. And when it does, it swings that big bulbous tail around. Whoosh. And misses entirely the the fighter. And now it moves. Five, ten. But it doesn't get close enough to actually get to you. Oh. It's moving slowly. All right. JD. You're still in um, melee range. Yep. Barrett is going to attack with his longsword. Let's see if he can hit this time. Come on, no whammies. That is a nine. Plus two is 11. With, with, What's wrong with me, sword? <laughs> <laughs> Bad guys. Okay, Max, save the day. Let's get a good salt packet in there. Okay. JD's trying to change trade his train his dice and what sand is supposed to be up. There yep. we go. Uh, eighteen. <laughs> eighteen. Roll one die four. Four. Eighteen. Four. That's eight points of damage for the salt. Ooh. <laughs> and it just kind of shrivels up into its thing, and you hear this loud hissing scream. <laughs> and it kind of collapses down on itself. Uh, you have killed the sh the um the pounder snail. 
I allowed double damage because you were using assault weapon. Oh. So now you'll be convicted of assault and battery. Got him. A little lemon butter. And... <laughs> <laughs> All right. So there you are in the room. There's one obvious door out. Uh, well, two if you look behind you. What would you like to do? Barrett is going to go inspect the body of the prior fighter and see if his sword is better than the one that keeps missing that he has. Yeah. It looks <laughs> Andy would have wanted nice. that. Uh, there's a little bit of chippage along the blade where it cr busted through the shell the first time. But well, other than that, it looks pretty good. Well, since his blade hasn't actually touched anything, there's no <laughs> chippage, so he'll keep it. You take the lucky sword. <laughs> nice. Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, did you have any gold left over on your character? Uh, 20, so I'll grab that as well. That makes sense to me. <laughs> hey, look, I got 40 gold. <laughs> there you go. All right. After you desecrate the body. My own character. That's awesome. <laughs> Get a little prayer to Moradin. Sorry, Andy. <laughs> Oh, this guy, it was rich. Wait a minute. Was that the priest's um, last rite? Sorry, Andy. <laughs> I'm going to less of a priest. <laughs> I would have given up on Morden entirely if I lost a second friend in one day. <laughs> um. So do you uh, at least say a prayer over your friend, or do you just ignore him? No, I'll say a prayer. Andy was cool. <laughs> Andy, we were going south, uh, and now it seems you're going south. I'll miss you dearly. Uh, I love you like a brother. We'll make sure to put your gold to good use. It'll make sure your bones will make great meal in the soil. Okay. So, <laughs> how are you going to do? Let's use the pole to open the door because we're squishy. <laughs> All right. You got then you open the door and it leads into a hallway. The hallway is goes in 30 feet, then turns right, goes 30 feet, turns left, goes 30 feet, and then it turns around into another corner. And this room I'm going to have drawn here. That's a door in front of it. Does the general vibe of the space, like these kids thought it was like maybe an abandoned, like, I don't know, root cellar or something? That's does this look thought, like. But it doesn't look like it's yeah. a root cellar at all. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Does it look like it's like actually something that someone built, like a like for housing, or does it look like we can discern what sort of purpose this place actually has? Uh, um... Or maybe not. The front room, uh, give me a roll under your wisdom for a, uh, like, a, kind of like a yeah. perception check. Since you're looking around and, and thinking about the purpose of the room. Hey, I did it. I rolled an eight. All right. Uh, there seems to be a large boulder. That fits seemingly along the south wall. Like maybe there's something behind it. Nice. What? Uh, the room that we in? were in or the room that we're going in? The room you were in. Okay. Uh, so on the opposite side of the wall where the door is, there was oh. a large boulder there. Now, since you guys uh, took the time to look around and try to see what kind of purpose this room might have had, uh, you don't find anything to indicate a purpose because there's no furniture or anything left behind or writings on the wall. But you did find that there was a boulder along the back wall that uh, was filling a what looks like an entrance of some sort. That's a nice boulder. A quick question. Behind it. 
Is it the only route of like egress? There's otherwise no other ways forward besides potentially that. Your your ways no. forward are the door that you opened to look down and came to, to get... a hallway. Oh. Or this um secret passage you found behind a boulder. Uh quick retcon question. The story setup was that some kids found a weird silver handle that they opened to get into this place. When we first entered this place, was the handle of the door actually silver? Yes. Or was that... Yeah. Was it something we could have taken, knowing that there might be some werewolves down here? Well, now that you look at it, it's just shiny pewter. Ah. Darn! No, no silver to add to me, Trader. Silver to add to a werewolf's lungs. Um, yeah. Um, well, you're definitely stronger than me. You want to bow on my pole and try to roll this boulder out of the way? Aye, right, let's do it. All right. Uh, roll underneath your strength to move the boulder. And I will not, since you're using the pole for leverage, I'll allow you to roll twice and take the lower two rolls. Okay, well, Barrett has a 15 strength, and I rolled a four. Okay, so you're able to move that boulder out of your way. And, um... That's... Uh, So you go down the tunnel. See a tunnel in front of you. Um, and it looks like it goes 30 feet in, and then it turns to the left. How wide is the tunnel? 10 feet wide. Okay. Did the boulder look out of place? Like, is it a boulder that, like, fell from somewhere, or is it a boulder that was rolled there to seal this in? It looks like, uh, now that you're examining it, it looks like not only does it look like something will see them in, but there are claw marks on it. And it looks like something had, has been moving it in and out occasionally. Like somebody was using this as a doorway. Oh, that's bad. But with uh, large claws. There's claw marks in the door. Really wish that door handle was silver. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, at least it's good that it's been moved in and out, that it's not just like we've unsealed the great evil that was been in prison for 10,000 years. <laughs> what makes you think it's a great evil? It could be just a minor evil. Or... Tiny evil. Small evil. Bite size, fun size even. Uh, so long as we're not the first, hopefully we won't be the last. Uh, um, I suppose this might be, uh, that dog they saw walking on two legs. I don't think it's a slimy thing, and I don't think a skeleton would leave claw marks. <laughs> Have we seen any signs of the cat? Investigate? Yeah. All right, who's going? For, are you going to go side by side since it's a 10 foot hallway? Or are you going to go one, then the other? What you doing? I got the armor, so you should go behind me. Okay. I'll be the big guy up front. Do you want to be stealthy since there's signs of creatures up further in? Oh, my chainmail's not very stealthy. Oh. It goes a clink, a clink all over the place. Oh. Ah, that. Ah. I'll try to, yeah, I guess we, we, we deal with the hand we're dealt, eh, Barrett? Let's, uh, let's be I brave, man. <laughs> All right. As you go deeper in, the passage turns to your left. 
and there seems to be an opening down at the end of it that uh, it goes like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 feet in front of you. But at the 40 foot mark, there seems to be a cave at, like entrance right there, not worked stone at all. Mm. So we can either continue in the this basement esque space or go in the cave. Yeah. Yeah. You, you want to approach the cave? What do you think, Barrett? I don't know. Mm. The cave is kind of scary, but you know, no worse than the rest of the place. Ah! Once we go in, I don't know if we can go back. Perhaps, uh, perhaps we explore the. The, the building before we explore the great unknown of the cave. I, I agree with you. Hopefully it's just a tomcat that made the other cats go missing. Mm, I doubt that. It seems a bit bigger than a tomcat. One can always pray. <laughs> oh. Now you find religion. You know, in a time of need, more than will come to us. You found the secret bear den. It's a dark and damp place with animal bones all over. The bear was getting ready to hibernate for winter and is furious at being awakened by the moving of the large stone boulder. Roll initiative. And to show you what you're looking at, you're there at the cave entrance. That second line is not there. Let me erase that. And I was promised a cat. You <laughs> know. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think telling you that there's a missing cat that was eaten by the giant snail is, is the same you. thing as <laughs> promising you a cat. <laughs> oh, hey, look at that. A dangerous narrative. Did you roll initiative? What'd you get on initiative? A five. Nice. A four and a five. A four and a five. Awesome. Hopefully this bear's groggy. <laughs> and the bear gets a three. Nice. Six. So. JD, you're first. Wow. Where's the bear? Up there in the corner. Up there in the corner, huh? So that's a square room? Uh, yeah, foot? it is a square room. 30 by, well, actually, it's not exactly square. Oh, well, yeah, is I it? got that. No, it is exactly square. 30 by 30. And then there's... Okay. The alcove that you're standing in. Yeah. So, all right. Well... I'm going to position myself, so... Or I'm going to... Barrett is going to position himself so that he is between himself and his friend, the dwarf. And um, just look threatening for a moment and hold his action. So he'll step out probably about 10 feet between him and um, him and Omelette and, and just kind of stand there with a sword and a shield looking threatening and making Arr! noises. Like that? Let's see. Sure. Okay. Rawr, you yell. And um, Max does what? Uh, seeing that Barrett's trying to use tact to like uh, maybe intimidate the bear uh, and give it other reason than to fight us. Maybe I'll like calmly uh, put down some of uh, my seven day rations uh, and then also start to like back up <laughs> okay and you put it down okay. in front of barrett and then continue to back up behind him so the bear Mean no harm <laughs> moves up to you and he goes fast Five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, thirty, thirty-five, forty. 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. He pounces around you, trying to find a good spot to claw you to death. Great. 
pretty rude. And he attacks first with his claws. First claw. Misses. Since he missed with that first claw, he won't get a hug in. Aren't you lucky? Yeah. 12. Uh, okay, that's, that's going to hit. Ouch. One claw. He does three hit points of damage. Okay. Now he attempts to bite you. Ouch. Jeez. And he bites the shield. That's my shield. Give it back. Now, I believe it's JD's turn. All right. Well, since he's not going to be scared of me, I'm going to just bash him. Here we go. No whammies. That is a nine plus two is 11. 11 to hit, huh? Okay. Yep. Uh, you just feel like it's sliding off his thick fur. <laughs> okay. You, you, you have to hit him a little harder to get it in there. All right. Um, J uh, Max. Um. Can I try to like get one of our sacks on his head so he can't see? Like roll the hit. Uh, I'm assuming you're moving up, trying to move up behind him. Yeah. Okay. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty. Okay. Natty Deuce. So a uh, twenty plus whatever the modifiers are for an improvised weapon. You do a nat twenty. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Uh, you have now uh, covered the bear's head with a um, with a bag. <laughs> so, JD, what are you going to do? Um, I'm not sure what Barrett thinks of the of the bear having a bag over its head. That. Not an event that he was expecting, but as <laughs> Bear has hit him pretty darn hard, he's going to try and hit him back. Okay. Oh, that's a 17. That's yeah! A Play him alive! We don't have much time! <laughs> like rodeoing the bear. <laughs> and for a total of three points of damage. All right. So the bear is now taking its first damage. And it goes, Arrgh! reels back. So, um, that means it's Max's turn. I, yeah, it goes JD, no, it goes Max. No, go JD, Max, and Bear. Yes. So, uh, Max, what are you doing? Um, I suppose I'll, if we're not backing down, I'll try to hit it with my, um, my melee weapon. I'll use my, um, uh, was it a mace? Yes. Yes. Or no, a mall. It's actually a yeah, mall. It's a two handed weapon. Yeah, I'll use my maul. All right, roll the hit. All right. Thirteen. You hit. Pop. Uh, is that the maul is a d ten minus two? Mm -hmm. A four. Okay, so seven total. All right. The bear takes it with a loud roar. And now it's the bear's turn. And I give me a second. I'm trying to find out the 
penalty for not being able to see. I guess blind? Uh, they don't have it listed under blind in here. Uh. Which is the first thing I looked up. So I'm going to see what, what's, what's the penalty for not having any light whatsoever. Cool. Now, I'll try to scurry off with my movement while I have it. I, if I saw that do that much damage to Barrett, um, a mince if it bites me. Um, but we seem to have it on the ropes. At least hopefully. You so know, Max, I'm, like I'm going to do what I think I know a real bear would do. He's going to oh, take okay. his round to remove the, the um, hood. And so that's the bear's turn. So we're back to Max. No, back to JD. All right. Um, another attack. Let's see if we do this again. That is an eight oh. for a total of ten. You missed. I missed. Uh, Max, are you going to club him again? Uh, I'll try clubbing him and then retreating, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 17. 17, that hits. You're getting lucky hits in there. How much damage are you going to do? I'm getting the bomb. Uh... D10 minus 2, which is 5. Okay. It's do or die! Unfortunately! He looks really wounded. He's like kind of shaking around like that. And it's a desperate move because you keep trying to beat on him. He claws you once. Ooh, oh, that's no. funny. Automatic hit, no other um, benefits, but definitely a hit. So, the first claw does four points of damage. Oh. I'm assuming that uh, Max is now, uh, not Max, but Amun is now dead. Uh -huh. So, the other claws come in there and he starts chewing and chewing on you. Um, so, JD, it's your turn. All right, another attack. You just killed my friend. <laughs> That's a natural 20. Yeah. Whoa. Uh, go ahead and ro roll your damage. Max damage, nine points. Oh, Great, yeah. so that one hit point he had left, you obliterate <laughs> him. Just put the sword right through his clavicle uh, space and into his heart and lungs. Just a, wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. He goes, ah, and falls over dead. All right. Um, we're going to end that here because we're out of time. But do note that your character now has a plus one battle axe. Oh. Very okay. nice. Yeah, that's, that's the treasure from this room. Okay. Sick. We've taken care of some of the... I think we still have maybe a skeleton if we're believing all of the, the rumors of locals uh, <laughs> reporting random spooky things. <laughs> you also have 240 experience points. Uh, the dead people don't get any experience points. That's true. But now Barrett has three people starting equipment. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. You, you also helped with the snail. Uh, so the snail was 75 divided by 2. Uh, so you get that many experience points. And uh, what do you guys think of basic fantasy? It was fun. Yeah, that was interesting. As you can tell, Classic. it can be brutal. Yeah. I'm kind of surprised yeah. you didn't switch out for bows so you could stay out of melee combat from these big brutes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we weren't very fast. They probably would have, especially the bear would have caught up to us. I don't He's know. Got a running speed of 40. I mean, a walking speed okay. of 40. So if he does a double, yeah. he's 80. And you're standing there going, nice. I moved 20 feet. Ow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was, that was do or die. As much as it wasn't fun to get into a second combat right there, if it wasn't going to back off or take the bait of food. Uh, we had to do some, and 
it, it kind of gives me like a medieval it's a medieval vibe but it's like a call of cthulhu kind of like threat level like every creature is a lethal level encounter uh and you have to be very very careful yes you definitely do have to do that so um oh, yeah Level five, we will start the um, quiz and uh, do our review. No rec therapist here, so we don't have to do the other quiz. So we just uh, see you guys at 4.05. Copy that. Thank you. In a sec.
This may have all I've been complaining about. Nothing real dynamic is. Yeah. Are we alive? Or are we memorized? Hey, it looks like we are good to go. There we are. Welcome back to RPG Volunteer Training are. Meeting Online. Today we have discussed the Did our basic quiz at the I, beginning. We are now going to redo welcome. the quiz. So that everybody has a chance to um, see if they actually learned anything today or they just like my good joke. Okay, quiz retake. Remember? In role playing game, on turn, psychological state that can and fast playing one thumb sorry it was on the stream um okay looks like the stream is working just so when we go yep. to break i put up a stagnant pick so i can actually Okay, because when I came back, uh, it said that there was an error in the stream. Not moving. But it's doing it now, so we're good. <laughs> Static <laughs> and dynamic. <laughs> anyway, question two. Now that everybody's out of the room, I can. According to bleed theory, the imaginary boundary between self against characters that identities known as the blank two. Question number three. Set of rules that are agreed upon by all participants how to interact with each such as pro real A in character duration of the rules a license a fireball it's called the blank the most important aspect Aspect contract is players accept the premise. Perhaps the most important the blank premise that not by the blank. One hand is already up. Question five, according to blank is also known as real world person or person other than the Okay, moving on. Question number six. Imaginary persona that is Be theory. This is also a blank blank participant.
Question number seven. If the FRP is an initialism, why or can you download it? Question number eight. Instead of AD and similar clones, recommend it for the FRB. According to the lecture, what of the reason? Uh, original question was five. How many of these people? Five for five. In the Oh, I, okay. I need to start making questions to see. What you're here? Okay, one thumb. You can put your thumb down now. Took me a while to write that one out. I can understand that. So question number nine. According to bleed theory, when the real world emotions, thoughts, relationship dynamics, and the physical states of the player have an effect on the player character PC, this is known as blank dash blank. Whereas when events within the game have an effect on the real world player during or after the game, this is known as blank blank. Okay, we got one hand up and a thumb up. Question 10. What is one of the most important tools to help manage and voicing between your own PCs or NPCs over the years and between many different groups? So, would you guys like my voices? Oh, yes. Did you enjoy yeah. the class? They were imaginative and very well done. Okay, thank you very much. Elvis, mm -hmm. bless you. All right, so now let's go ahead and go through the quiz and see how well you've done. Question number one. Um, let's start with Max first. Sure. In the role playing games, the one word term used to describe the emotional, psychological, and physical states that can transfer between real life and fantasy role playing games is. Lead. Okay. JD. Question number two. According to Bleed Theory, the imaginary boundary between the player's self-identity and the player character that is created by the rules, identities, and occurrences within the role-playing game session is known as the... Magic Circle. Good, good, good. Max, the set of rules that are agreed upon by all participants on how to interact with each other in and out of character, such as no real-life touching, 
day in character for the duration of the session. When player throws a red foam packet, it symbolizes a fireball, etc. This is called social contract. Very good. Question number four. Perhaps the most important aspect of the social contract is the blank, which players accept the premise that any actions in the game are taken by the player character and not by the player. JD. That is the alibi. Question five. According to bleed theory, the blank is also known as the blank blank in which the real world person or persona rather than the imaginary character, Max. Uh, self and primary identity. Very good. We're halfway through the quiz. Uh, Max, do you have 100%? JD, do you have 100%? So far, yes. Excellent. So, JD, the imaginary persona that is used within the game itself is known as the blank blank in most RPGs. In Bleed Theory, this is also referred to as the blank blank of the participant. The player character and the alter ego. Very good. Question number seven, Max. BFRPG is an initialism for what? Where can it be downloaded? Where can you download it? Basic Fantasy Role Playing Game and BasicFantasy.org. Correct. www.basicfantasy.org. Yay! Question number eight. Uh, for training community programs, high risk populations, rubric and BFRPG instead of D&D and similar clones, according to lecture, what are five of the reasons? Um, JD, give me one. Accessibility. Max, give me one. Uh, easy to customize. JD. Clear causality. Very good. And Max? Uh, free PDF and affordable print version. Yes. Um, easy to get. So we yep. have accessibility, clear causality, affordable print version, easily customized, and easy to get. You actually gave two answers in one there. Oops. That's all right. Also, bonus points for active community support, clean, accessible layout, Bing. and available in many Bing. languages. Bing. Everybody at 100 plus now? Yep. What well, were active community support, available in many languages, and what was the third one? Clean, clean accessible layout. layout. Nice. All right, those are our bonus answers. That we've gotten you more. Question number nine. According to the bleed theory, when the real world emotions, thoughts, relationship dynamics, and physical states of the player have an effect on the player character, this is known as JD. Bleed in. Whereas when events within the game have an effect on the real world player during or after the game, this is known as facts. Bleed out. Very good. All bleeding eventually stops. <laughs> yeah, Fingers crossed. Nope, it's true. Eventually, the bleeding will stop, no matter what you do. <laughs> That's, that you. is true, yes. Question 10. What is one of the most important tools to help manage voicing between your own PC or NPCs over the years and between many different groups? Uh, Three by five cards or notes. Excellent. JD, do you have 100? I have better than 100. Yay! <laughs> Max, you have 100. Awesome. I... Have you heard Woo! about the new Vulcan salute? I don't know if I want to. Live long or die trying. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> that was good. I like that. I like JD's alternate answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, let's talk about next week. I shouldn't have closed that. Because we have to talk about our homework.
All right. Remember to sign up for help, helping giving back to the community at least two four-hour sessions per month. So eight hours per month. These hours are required to complete the before the final exam. What is your guys' plans for that, JD? Um. Well, I'm already attending the second training on Monday night. Um, I actually plan to attend your um, public speaking event on Wednesday again. That was quite fun. I really enjoyed that. Okay. I um, hopefully will be uh, will be recognized as being there this time. Yes. Yeah. Also, <laughs> uh, you can. Uh, there's is a thing tonight where we're going to be trying out some hybrid role playing games. That will be no oh, hybrid tonight. Uh, that will be at six, six thirty. Six to nine. Yes. Okay, six to nine o'clock. Last week I waited around until six thirty. Nobody showed up. Six to nine, a new games evaluation. Either yeah. one of you are welcome to show up for that. Yep. I can come tonight. Uh, right. I'll already be here for the grant meeting in between. I'll just stay on. It'll be interesting because we're using a card game where, uh, fortunately, you'll have open hands, and uh, you'll just tell us what you want to do. Because I can't cool. hand you cards through the internet. I tried once, and I just crumpled the cards against the camera. Mm. That's a bad thing. Yeah, that's what they keep telling me. All right. Uh, so use audio video recording tool of choice. But Max, what is your cho uh, things that you're going to do to give back to the community? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll attend tonight's game session. Um, I run a lot of games, though I don't know if that counts uh, specifically to well, the what RPG. Games you run? Uh, I run... I, I run 5e games most uh the majority of nights of the week i'm happy to bring some people in them if people want oh we can set up a game for you to run um through sure. our platform yeah i'm down, down. Oh, okay cool uh i'm down with it got it yeah, I'll participate tonight, but let's set up a game to run. Hmm. All right. Also, I need you to use an audio or video recording tool of your choice. Who's I'm using the next thing, which is the voice recording. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Back to what I was actually saying, using an audio video recording tool of your choice, record at least one if a level one player trainee, or two if a level one GM trainee, distinctly different voices applying the eight variables. Make sure that you have written down all eight variables for each voice on your cards. Uh, and then when you finish recording the voices, send the recording file or link to your mentor or supervisor. In other words, me, John at RPGresearch.com. That's how you get fit. You know that, right? Um, you finish recording your voice and recording the video, uh, then you can also get associated badges and those are uh, formulated out better. Don't forget to post in your chat room at least one com comment on your experiences of this week's training and comment on somebody else's comment. And the best place for that is still Discord. Yep. All right. Questions, concerns, from a lot of comments. Six o'clock is in this channel in training. Yep, six o'clock uh, Pacific time. Not New York. Copy time. that. Mm -hmm. Is the grant meeting also in this channel? Oh, um, no, that'll be um, fundraising. Got it. Or slash, slash fundraising. fundraising. Yeah. Uh, may I ask Default what the grant meeting is? That? What is the grand meeting? Uh, grant writers. 
Okay. It sounded it sounded like you said grand, not grand. <laughs> okay, grand old meeting. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I was thinking you said. <laughs> that's uh, January. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I got I got that note um, when the meeting was canceled. And it will probably have to be next year. Oh, that would be lovely. Yes. All right, we're going to close this out with a few jokes. Yes, uh, the dragon walks into a bar. 300 plus one-liner zingers and jokes at Will Slay by Jeff Aldrich and John Taylor. Uh, it's an RPG joke book. Here's the cover. Here's the back. Credit has been given where credit is due. I didn't make up any of these jokes, so don't blame me. Keep your tomatoes to yourself. Why is it hard to have a conversation around a tiefling? No idea. Always burning uh, in. Meh, meh. Considering the tiefling, personally, I've always found a tiefling trying while at a cocktail gathering and sacred rituals. Because no matter how interesting your story, they'll always seem to have a tail to top it. Meh, meh. Why couldn't the druid get around town? I don't know. Why couldn't the druid get around town? He was stuck in neutral. <laughs> no! <laughs> Speaking of alignment, we have a chaotic evil paladin whom we nicknamed Life Alert because he's fallen and he can't get up. Uh... Regarding the anti-paladin, very well then, I have executed a proper wake up and breakfast. I hope you we are through with the frivolities of light bulb jokes. Now, the task at hand. The joke is older than my great uncle's teeth, and he is the first and eldest dragon of order. Shall I put a kettle on while you ready your joke regarding the location of the beef? Yeah, we're not that old. <laughs> yeah, obviously this was written by a millennial. What are you going to call them <laughs> after millennials? Nah, they're going to call them flappers. They're just going to recycle the old ones. <laughs> All right. Oof. A man it's the Zoom generation. A... It, it's Gen Z, the, the Zoom generation. A man walks into a bar. Bard says, what is this? Some kind of joke? But um, it's pretty good. And it we hurt. are done. Thank you. It's exactly 4.30. Uh, thank you all for all right. watching. Please donate at rpgresearch.com forward slash donate so that my jokes don't get any worse. And uh, if you want to volunteer and learn from us, go to rpgresearch.com forward slash volunteer where you can find the link to rpgresearch.com forward slash jobs and actually apply for something. And of course, uh, if you want to join us for not as a volunteer, but as actually play a game with us or experience an event with us, like on April 20th, we're going to be doing a Dungeons and Dragons epic. Six Dungeons and Dragons tables, levels one through 16, all playing in the same module and experience and coming together. It's called an epic for the Curse of Strahd. It's a $5 Ooh. entry fee, but you can find that at rpgresearch.com forward slash events. And there's other, of course, events that you can join us at. The fundraiser is for Spokon, spokon.org, and they are the local literary and science fiction convention that is becoming more and more of a gaming convention because of the influence of somebody. It is a 501c3 nonprofit. 
they get books for libraries and schools. So, and uh, what's the word? Encourage literacy. Did I read that right? Anyways, I told you, you don't donate, my jokes get worse. All right, good night. See you back here at six o'clock for our gaming. Uh, good night and dream well. JD? Good night, all. Thank you for the training. And uh, as always, it's been fun. X? Good night. Take care, y'all. We all died, but we had fun doing it. <laughs>